Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and as requested I'm going to give you a bit of an update about what's coming up over the next couple of weeks on the channel. But before I do that, I'll bring up the banner. I just want to say thank you to all the new people who've signed up for Patreon. A few people have upped their tiers. Uh, so thank you very much to all of you because without you I couldn't afford to do this. So um, if you are considering yourself becoming a patron or channel member, the information you need is in the description below. So I'll let that scroll there for a minute. So, um, yeah, uh, it's been a busy time. I've been busy scheduling shows, emailing people back and forth, lots coming up. I did the little show a few days ago about the Monte Cassino series. Now, that's starting on May the 6th, I think it is, and that's going to run more or less to the end of that month. There might be one or two shows in the month that are not Italy 1944 related, but the majority will be uh, Monte Cassino and the wider Italian campaign. Before that, we've got some other stuff coming up. So I'll bring up my, um, my my PowerPoint now. So tonight or this afternoon, depending on where you are, or late morning, depending on where you are, Prit Butar is back. So you don't need me to tell you much about the show. If it's Prit, it'll be fantastic. It is actually talking about the German escape back over the Oder River in January 1945. And, um, you know, as I said, you don't need me to say much. If you have watched the channel a lot, you'll know how brilliant Pritt's presentations are. He's always erudite and um, knowledgeable and answers all the questions. So that's later on tonight or this afternoon about that one there. So that's just finishing off, sort of finishing off our Eastern Front week. Although tomorrow's show is also Eastern Front connected, but it's also connected with my ongoing series about Churchill. Um, I've done over a thousand of these things uh, on the channel. And although Churchill obviously looms large in World War II history, I hadn't actually done anything specifically about Churchill until last week uh, when Walter Reed came on and talked about Churchill's interesting and sometimes troubled relationship with India. Well, tomorrow, Jeffrey Roberts, who is an incredibly distinguished historian, one of those types of people that I didn't think I'd be able to attract to the channel he teaches over in, the, in Ireland, is in highly regarded. He's going to talk about another complicated relationship, that between Churchill and Stalin. So we're going to focus on the war years, but it, it continued in the post-war years as well. But it's all about the, the not just the two of them, but also the relationship, the wider relationship between the British and the Allies and uh, or the Western Allies and, and the Soviets. So that should be a good one. Uh, that's tomorrow evening. So a rare Saturday show, but there's no Ipswich playing. Ipswich aren't playing tomorrow. It's not till the week after. And if you uh, care anything about the championship, I'm yes, I'm very nervous about what uh, what's going to happen. And is it going to be Ipswich, Leicester, Leeds go up, or Southampton go to a, long, a, a late run and get into the, the, to the automatic races? I don't know. But anyway, that's uh, no football on Saturday. So I'm looking forward to talking to Jeffrey Roberts. Then on Monday, Next week's shows are, are ostensibly kind of building up to D-Day. Uh, by, and by building up to D-Day, I mean both me as a content creator building up to the June 6th period. So some of them will touch on the Normandy campaign, but also talking about the preparations in advance of Operation Overlord. Now, this particular show with Dermot is about uh, after the invasion. And if you don't know, Dermot does lots of work for the Ministry of Defence, but he also looks at the psychology of warfare and Dermot has put together a study about just how effective the Churchill crocodile uh, tanks were, the flamethrower tanks. Um, I've seen uh, how he's described what he's researched. I've seen some of his data and it'll be really, really fascinating. It will, um, it will shed light on a vehicle that kind of everybody knows about, but actually based on the studies of what difference it made on the battlefield and what difference it made on the battlefield if you're an enemy soldier, uh, facing uh, one coming towards you. So that's that's mon uh, Monday. And then continuing in the week, this will be an exciting one. Matthew Powell was on a couple of years ago talking about the RAF in 1940. He's back again. Now, Matthew, you couldn't get anybody more qualified than him. He, he you know, it works at Cranwell, the RAF, you know, headquarters and where all the uh, um, education aspect is done. And um, this is about how the doctrine for Normandy was developed both by the army command units that was a, a unit that was an early war thing from 41 to 43 and what was learned in the Western desert by the Desert Air Force and then how they put those um, 
um, trials and tribulations and practices uh, into deployment for the Normandy campaign. So at the moment, that's my only um, air power in Normandy show for the next few weeks. But there will be more scheduled as I get guests sorted out and work things out. But that will be about how the basic doctrine for the Normandy campaign was developed, mostly about the the British and Commonwealth side of things. I'm sure Matthew will touch on Americans as well. So that's that's next week as well. Um, Machine Gun. So this is one of the shows I like doing. Martin kind of contacted me. He runs an incredible website about the Manchester Regiment. And if you know the British Army, you'll know that there were dedicated machine gun battalions, regiments in World War II, the Manchesters, the Cheshires, the Middlesex, the notable ones. And he's going to talk, talk us about his work running this website and how he's put together the, the history of the the battalion that landed in Northwest Europe. So how they were trained, how they were put together, leadership, how that all worked and how they came and arrived in Normandy and what they did in the Normandy campaign, including the use of indirect fire. You may remember we did a show with Richard Fisher a couple of years ago about the Middlesex Regiment. Well, continuing that, that, that subject um, uh, about the use of machine guns in the British Army. So that'll be really interesting. Um, can't wait for that one. Next one, uh, Ben Jones is incredibly well regarded, another Americanist, and he's going to be talking about Eisenhower's guerrillas. Now, these are the Jedbras, Jedbergs, however you want to pronounce it, Jeds. Um, this, these are the units that they kind of come out of the OSS, SOE, Airborne, and it's the teams of American, British, and uh, French operators who are doing all sorts of intriguing stuff behind the lines pre D Day and after D Day. Um, Benjamin came as a recommendation via another author um, who I contacted, who is unable to appear these days. He's, he's too kind of too, too um, incapacitated, shall we say? He can't do podcasts and stuff. So I've, I got Benjamin's details. So I'm looking forward to that. We've never done anything about the Jeds. Um, they've come up kind of occasionally in in, the, in conversations, but that will be a dedicated program. What their mission was uh, involved in the liberation of France. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um, then the week after, Alex Churchill is back on. So Alex, as you know, is a friend of the channel. And Alex is is really um, pushing the boundaries, shall we say, and how history is shared. She's always involved in podcasts and TV appearances. She writes as well. She appears on channels like mine and her own stuff. She's got a new Substack page where she's offering history of different um, eras. And, you know, I just, I think Alex is brilliant. She's um, fantastic. So we're going to have a conversation about being a historian in 2024, what are the challenges? How are the the um, the, the methods, different methods of sharing history with people? Uh, you know, Alex is a is a is a blunt speaker. I like her because of that. She doesn't you know pull her punches, and so I'm looking forward to that conversation with Alex about history. Um, in yes, Jay, she's great, and um, and she's the kind of person that. Um, you know, some people, some of the old stuffy people are, who is this person coming on and talking in kind of modern language and swearing about things like that? But if you can't swear about the chaos and carnage on Tarot, what can you swear about? So Alex is coming on and to talk about her new history project. So there we go. So this is all, you know, if you want to find out the schedules, they're, they're just go to World War II TV and all the shows are, are coming up. They're different times of day. Uh, some are in the usual evening UK slot. Uh, the one with Churchill is kind of midday, I think, UK time. We're looking forward to that. Now, this one only came together in the last uh, few days. Jesse is an American Brit. He actually comes from a different background, which I love because military history is a, is a great um, avenue for sharing history. But Jesse has written biographies of the the, uh, the, the ACDC and rock rock histories. And she, he, he, is, honestly, she, he has come in to look at this case of Charles Howard Dick Ellis. Now, he was an MI6 um, operative and a... a for many years, people post-war were saying that he was one of Britain's most dangerous double agents, was working for the Germans and possibly even working for the Russians uh, post-war, so a triple agent. So this is going to be about Jesse's proce process of examining all this evidence for and against uh, this guy who is either a hero or a spy or both. Uh, whether Jesse will reveal what his conclusion is in his book, I don't know. But he will talk about the process of examining the evidence and and determining whether or not this this figure is is guilty get guilty as charged by some of the books written about him in the fifties and sixties. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um, moving on, uh, James is coming on to talk about uh, 
the Casablanca conference in, in Morocco. This is the conference where Eisenhower, Churchill, de Gaulle, um, who else was there? Um, Marshall, uh, Patton, Alan Brook, Mountbatten, Harold Alexander, everybody was there discussing how they would bring the war to an end. So this is where they they hammer out the plan for the invasion of the second front into, into Europe, into France. So, so D-Day, so it could, it's part of the kind of our pre-D-Day series, but it's also part of our Churchill, our ongoing Churchill series. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what James has to say about this, because this is coming not that long, this meeting uh, in January 43, after the Operation Torch, which was probably the, uh, the, the time of the war when the relationship between the Americans and the Brits was, was most tested. And now they've got to sit down and thrash out how they're going to bring the war to an end. So I'm interested to hear what he has to say about that meeting and, and what was said and the reper repercussions and the ramifications. So that'll be, that'll be pretty good. He's written about Bon Scott as well. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's coming up. This is another one. Christian was on uh, in our railways series a few months ago, maybe even more than that now, uh, giving a general rundown about how uh, railways have contributed to the success of various armies in various wars. Well, if you remember the end of that show, he talked about working on his next book, which is about um, how the Allies put ra uh, railroad railways back together again in France and beyond to to push the Allied advance on towards Germany. Um, there's been lots of debate on Twitter recently about the words forgotten and untold in various books, but this really is an untold story. How many of you know much at all, if anything, about the, the massive engineering project that went in to, to, to bring, you know, um, engines over to Europe to be able to maximize the use of, of um, France's rail system. So that's what we uh, have coming up. I'm um, just, I just happy to see a question there. Um, yes, Robert, I have marked on my diary, uh, about the anniversary of the turkey shoot. Um, I haven't necessarily pinned down anybody to come and talk about it. I am working on a few Pacific shows to kind of throw into the mix in June and July. Um, it's on my list. Um, so, no, we haven't covered it. Um, I don't think it may have come up in passing, but there is something I will do. That's on my list. Uh, I have got a massive great list of things to do, Robert. I do want to remind people I am just me on my own. I do absolutely everything here. I do the scheduling, the emails, the graphics, the hosting, the the everything. So I, I will do that. Um, so that's I'm looking forward to the Liberation Line talking to Christian. Joe Balkowski has been a friend of mine for well, uh, 20 plus years. He's the uh, uh, the official historian for 29th Division, but he hasn't actually been on the channel for, for ages. I uh, don't quite know why. Just haven't got round to it, but in the build up to D Day series, he's going to talk about the 29th Infantry Division in England, how they train, how they're put together. He's also going to mention, because I asked him to, the 29th Rangers. Now, we all know about 1st, 2nd, and 2nd, uh, and 5th Battalion Rangers landing on D Day, Point Duhok, Omaha Beach, but there was a 29th Division Ranger Battalion that was created and trained and it ended up getting kind of pushed us, you know, dis dismantled, and some of the men went into the real Rangers, some went back into 29 division. We're going to talk about that. Uh, the picture, the black and white picture there is of Harold Baumgarten, who was a mutual friend of Joe and mine, and he uh, was an incredible guy who was wounded five times on Omaha Beach. I just put that in there because it's him sitting, well, I, I took the background of the photo out, but he was sitting on a wall, and I, f I feel it was somewhere like somewhere in Dorset in 1944, uh, but that he'll be coming up. And so this is about the training, the 29th Division in England. There'll be um, other shows later on about other units, how they prepared for Normandy, I hope. Um, it's just a question of getting them together and getting, getting guests together. And don't forget, of course, that in June, a lot of the Normandy historians will be in Normandy that week. So if you look at my when I start putting my Monte Cassino schedule up, the June the sixth period, I'm not sure what I'm doing yet. I will kind of let you know when I when I know myself. So I'm looking forward to speaking to Joe about 29th Division. David Stahl is coming back. If you watched his incredible show on Monday about the letters that Guderian and his wife exchanged uh, based on his book about Hitler's Panzer Generals, uh, we got to about an hour or hour and a quarter or something and. Um, it was brilliant, and it was one of the most viewed shows in the last couple of weeks on the channel. So, um, but we didn't get to the correspondence of a couple of the other generals. So I asked David, "Do you want to come back and do a part two? And he said, "Yeah, uh, he's going to come back and do a part two. So um, that's May the something rather May the fourth or something. Um, so you have to wait a bit because it won't be for a month or so. But uh, and David right now is 
he's both teaching and he's ac acting headmaster of a school or something because someone's away. So he's juggling about three different uh, plate, four or five different balls. Man. So that David Starr coming back to continue that story. Yes, Gary, Gary Joe is always great. Can't be wait to do that. And hi, hi, Mia. Yes, 29th Rangers. Yeah, we, we, we love it. I Again, another unit that I've never really talked about on the channel. I said they never got to see action, but some of the 29th Rangers went ex to extraordinary places. Jack Womer was a 29th uh, Ranger. He ended up joining the 506th of the 101st Deb and became one of the filthy 13, but he had been in the 29th Division as a Ranger, so that would be a good one. Um, so, and then the final thing I want to mention today is I want to give a shout out to a friend of mine, Martia in Holland, who has started a podcast with her friend, Sam. So the link to this is in the description below. It's there on the screen. So it's called Rosie the Reviewer, and it's two girls talking about war movies, media, documentaries, things like that. And Marty is a great person. And uh, I just applaud anybody getting involved in this media sharing podcasting creating world world it's it's highly competitive and it's hard to make a get get yourself started and get a following but uh, i hope you give the two girls a chance and listen to what they've got to say the first episode is about band of brothers i met marty on a band of brothers tour with matthew leach and eric Daw and others back in june last year so that's um that's coming up that's the, the first show is is up now uh so check the link out go and check out rosie the reviewer they'd be delighted if a few of you sign up for that and start listing it because it's always terrifying when you become a, a new podcast and you're kind of waiting for those first few people to uh to listen to you um so that's my last thing i'm gonna mention in terms of other podcasts uh there are various ones that have started recently. James Jeffries and, and Jane Gifford Lowe's have started one, Never Mind the Dam Busters. Victoria Taylor, the REF Luftwaffe expert, is starting a series of pods uh, soon. As soon as I know more about it, I will let you know about that. Um, another thing I want to mention is um, I'm going to be doing an, another occasional series where I talk to people who are part of uh, museums, history projects about what they're doing, uh, how people like yourself, new viewers, can help there. Because although I'm only quite a small fish in the content creating world, there are much, much bigger fish than me, like JD at History Underground and and many others, Chris at Vlogging Through History. I still have a, a little bit of a, a presence. And so I'm keen to give museums and projects a little bit of publicity. Uh, so uh, I've got Doug coming on from the Gherkin Museum in May. It's a first of going to be two episodes about the Gurkhas. The first one, he, as the assistant curator at the Gurkhas Museum, is going to talk about you know, the general history of the Gurkhas. We did have a real Gurkha come on a couple of years ago, Tim Garung, and talk about some of the Gurkha traditions. But Doug is going to kind of bring in some of the uh, the British Army connections to the Gurkhas. And then there's going to be another uh, show later in the year when their museum redevelopment is finished, where he's going to talk about the Gurkhas in Italy. So um, if you are running a museum or a project, a D-Day project, a Pacific War project, whatever it was, and you'd like to come on and chat about it and and, and uh, bring uh, your project to attention of the World War II TV audience, please drop me a line and I'll do what I can. So there we are. Um, I'm just reading Gary's comment there. It's not an Ask Me Anything show, but I'll do a couple of questions before I go. Uh, the work and dedication you put into your shows, I feel are unparalleled on, on unparalleled on YouTube. Well, yes, Mag would agree. My, the, I say I'm a one man man, but of course, Mag is who's a working battlefield guy. The norm she's out today touring with Boy Scouts for America, uh, doing Merville Battery and things like that today. She, she, you know, works on World War II all day, then comes back and and I carry on talking about it. So. Uh, yeah, um, uh, sometimes Mag has to endure a lot of the World War II TV pressure. Um, that's a good point there. Um, Great Dominion, World War One TV. At some point, I'm going to do an announcement about it. Basically, Lucy's too busy. Uh, she's enjoyed doing what she's doing. Um, she's writing a book. There's other things going on. She, she, she also has some issues with social media and pressure and stuff like that, the whole female historian thing. Um, so at some point, when I have time and, um, well, it's time, basically, I'm going to look for a new World War One TV host to continue that. So it's on a hiatus. It's hibernating right now. It's not not given up. Um, it's just um, it's on my list of things to do, my ever going list of things to do. Um, just, um, Ian, it's a good point. Um, I have planned um, 
a set of shows about neutral countries in World War II, but it won't be yet. It won't be until probably after the 80th anniversary season. So to 2024 and 2025 when I catch all the 80th anniversaries. And then when that's done, so when we get 2026, so uh, I know it's a long way, I'm going to go back and revisit some of the subjects I haven't had time to kind of fit in with all the anniversaries. And one of the things I want to do is over a two week period is go through all the various countries and examine their neutrality, how they how they participated in a, in the war in other ways or didn't participate, who did they support, blah blah blah. So um, yeah, I, I will be doing something about Ireland at at some point. But you never know. What happens is I every day I open up my emails and messages come in from publishers and authors saying, "Hey, can you can you um, look at this? I've got a new book out, or I'm doing this, and suddenly a show can happen that I wasn't at all thinking about." So. Um, yeah and kevin yes there will be some operation dragoon content in august i've already got two maybe three shows uh kind of in the back of my mind for that um as you probably know it's not uh written about anything like as much as um as d-day so uh, the d-day in front in, in normandy but i will be doing some dragoon content and some bagration or bagration however you want to say the uh, soviet offensive in june i'll be doing some bagration content as well um the the trick is is finding enough time to fit all the shows in and finding enough time to get them all planned because those cursed allies back in june and july 1944 were doing a lot of things a lot of different theaters and for me to try and accom accommodate and acknowledge all these anniversaries is um it's a little bit difficult i will do as many as i can and although um I am doing some Normandy content this June, obviously, because it's where I live. I actually feel I've neglected Normandy, really, over the last couple of years. I mean, I started on World War II TV with lots of Normandy shows because it's where I lived. And back in the COVID days when Mag and Colin and others were, were not working all the time, they could go out and do the live filming for, for me. We've kind of moved on from that because they're too busy and, and things have changed with the channel. But um, actually, I don't think I've done as much Normandy content over the last couple of years as I could have. But this year, of course, for the 80th, I'm going to do some stuff. But it won't be a just conventional running through the events of June the 6th again. So uh, I've got a uh, uh, historian, Greg, he's coming on to talk about the, the US 1st Division. But rather than talking about Easy Red and, and pushing up the jaws on D-Day, which I've covered on the channel and will be covered on all sorts of other programs, he's going to be covering with me the 1st Division pushing for the Comon Gap. I think I mentioned this in the Monte Cassino show as well. So... Um, and yes, there'll be some Arnhem stuff coming up in September. I mean, I did a big market garden series a couple of years ago, so I won't be going over some of that new ground, but there are a few authors I didn't get to last time that want to speak to. I'm sure there's some angles about that. Maybe Al Murray's new market garden book will be out by September. He might uh, be willing to come on and talk again. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, lots of stuff coming on. Um I will just I will keep doing these. Basically, the request came in. Can you do a update show? So I'm doing an update show. You know what's coming up. Um, that takes those shows I showed you earlier. That takes us up to about May the third, something like that. Then I said, then it's Monte Casino, and then after Monte Casino, early June will be a bit of D-Day stuff, and I'll be doing maybe doing some live streams from battlefields during the D-Day week. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, on June the sixth, I should say, I plan to do maybe five, six, maybe seven or eight separate shows that day kind of harking back to the original d-day live stream i did back in when it was black and white and i was just a teenager and it wasn't that long ago um so i've got some historians who aren't going to be in normandy who are going to join me from their from their homes to talk about some stuff there's going to be some really good guests coming your way but i haven't worked it out yet um so there you are i'm gonna leave it at that because um because i am and um i just want to say again thank you for all your support and I don't like doing the cap in hand stuff, but if you are a regular viewer or not a regular viewer, please um, consider um, at the minimum subscribing. As I said in the last one of these, 60% of viewers are not subscribed. You do not know, or you should, you must know how important it is for a creator to have more subscribers. It's not the be all, be all and end all. Views is good as it is, but subscribers really counts. And the hurdle that I want to leap over, I'm, I'm crawling towards it at a snail's pace, is the 100,000 100, subscribers. I hit 75,000 subscribers a couple of days ago, which is amazing. 
I'm getting between one and a half and 2,000 subscri new subscribers a month right now. It slumped a bit. November, December, it was like 3,000 a month, but it slumped a bit now. So maybe, maybe with a prevailing wind and some decent coverage around in the Monte Cassino series, maybe I can hit that 100,000 uh, subscriber mark by the end of the year, which means I get a little kind of a award thing, like a Perspex glass kind of thing to stick on my mantelpiece. Like uh, when you win pointless on the BBC, you get a little thing. So I'd like to get that. And, you know, that I have to say there would have been a, t a time when I thinking I was going to get to 10,000 subscribers would have, would have been amazing. But I said it in the last one of these, I do genuinely think that the caliber of guests of guests I bring you is deserving of more views than we're getting. I know it's long format history. I know we don't use animations and recreated footage and and whiz bangs and graphics. And it's it's kind of just me talking to someone and they talk about the history that they've studied. But that's, I think, what I like, I like about it. It's just history. It's just history presented by people who know what they're talking about. You may not agree with every guest, but over the balance of things, you get a range of opinions. And that's what I like about it. So there you are. Um, I'm going to say good. I said, I said that before, but I really am going to say uh, good afternoon to you now. And I will see you all again with Prit later on to talk about um, the Eastern Front. So thanks, everybody. I'll just I'll just I'll just put that little co that comment up there because it's nice. Well deserved. Best World War II channel on YouTube and in general. So there we are. What brilliant words to end on. So click like and subscribe and I'll see you all later on. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye.